um, as you say, um, my dad went to in and out and we went to in and out my whole family and my whole friends. And um, my dad preaches the gospel out um, in and out and now, and my dad is named Z. Um, he's Z and we, uh, we love that so much. And his name is Z. So we're gonna talk about preaching the gospel like my dad. So, hey guys, we're gonna talk about preaching the gospel like my dad. So, it said, She's acting like she's reading right here. Oh no, now we gotta start over. Oh. Gotta start over, we gotta start over. Um, Praise God. Um, I love my baby so much. How many are grateful about what God is doing? I, I see Bethel, I see Judah, and I see what God's doing in this next generation. And I don't think we're gonna understand the depth of the seeds we're sowing right now in this season until the next, amen? Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for this word that you've placed on my heart, specifically for tonight, God, for your people that are here tonight. I pray that you would anoint it and speak through us, God. We love you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. I'm going to be opening up to Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And um, the song that I sang correlates with this portion of scripture. Um, Eyes on the throne until I get home. I'm ready the king coming back. How many love that song? Right? Okay. And I, I want to talk to you about a man by the name of Stephen. Everybody say Stephen. And it says in Acts chapter 6 verse 1, Now about this time when the number of disciples was increasing, a complaint was made by the Greek-speaking Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. There were some widows being overlooked in the distribution of the food that were supposed to go to them. And I want to talk to you tonight about how ministry is birthed out of hunger. Can I get an amen? True ministry many times is birthed out of hunger. Two types of hunger. Hunger from a man or a woman of God that has gotten desperate to see God move in your city. Is there anybody in this place tonight? that says, I don't want to do church as normal, but I'm hungry for a true move of the Spirit, and I'm desperate. I'll, I'll go the measures that it takes to see God do something special in my region, and my region won't go to hell on my watch. I will preach the gospel. I will pray, and I will fast because I am hungry. Is there anybody in this place hungry? Am, am I at Revival Fire Network? I, I, feel, I thought this was called Fire Nights. Is there anybody on fire for Jesus tonight? Man, I don't know about you, but I flew in from California with a fire shut up in my bones. And I can't contain it tonight. I want to preach the gospel. Even after this, we might go out. Come on, somebody. You got to be ready for anything around my mother-in-law. Come on. And it says they selected Stephen, a man full of faith in Christ Jesus and filled with and led by the Holy Spirit and six others but I'm gonna focus on Stephen tonight they brought these men before the Apostles and after praying they laid their hands on them to dedicate and commission them for this service there was an apostolic commissioning for what maybe many in church today would think is not a big ministry See, Stephen was not prayed in as one of the apostles. Stephen was prayed in to basically run a food bank for widows. But he took his job and his responsibility from God so serious that he turned a food bank into a revival center. I'm going to preach it over here. Stephen took a food bank... He took it serious and filled with the Holy Spirit. He turned it into a revival center. I began to read this and I said, it kind of reminds me of a ministry out in Western New York called Revival Fire Network. When they go out, they don't just hand people groceries. People get filled with the Holy Spirit. People get healed. People get delivered. Is there anybody in this place that says, God, I will take my job serious? 
There's no, there's no insignificant part of the kingdom. Matter of fact, I feel like the more I'm learning, the lower you go, the higher you go. A food bank turned into a revival center. And it says, and the message of God kept on growing and spreading. And the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. How many know hell was scared? How many know as we grow in this place, as RFN grows, as Cornerstone grows, the devil, he's, he's mad. Don't be surprised when you get hit. Come on, somebody. Some of you say, man, I had it better in the world. That's because you were going in the same direction as the devil. And now that you're saved and living for the Lord, you are a target. Amen? It says this right here. And a large number of even the priests were becoming obedient to the faith, accepting Jesus as Messiah and acknowledging him as the source of eternal salvation. It says the priest, those that even had a form of godliness, all of a sudden were not just satisfied with religion. I feel like this is a prophetic picture because as I've traveled the last few months, I have seen people that have been in church for 20 years all of a sudden want to do away with tradition and they want a fresh move of God. They say, I'm done playing church. I really want to live this thing out. I'm done playing church. Come on, you have to turn my mic up a little bit more. We're going to get rowdy in this place. Is there anybody in this place that says, I don't want business as usual, but I want to really know God? And see him move in my life. Even the priest started, you know what this is? Religion was starting to be broken. Religion, a spirit of religion was starting to be broken. That's why you guys here, from what I hear, have gotten some, you guys have gotten some lashback. Come on, somebody. <laughs> come on. Anybody in this place got some, come on, people upset. You know, you know what's so funny to me is I, I've preached the truth of the gospel many times, and I've had, I've had people that are living homosexual lifestyle come up to me. I've had drug addicts come up to me, hug me, tell me, thank you for preaching the truth. You know who usually gets mad? It's the religious people. It's the religious people that are mad, that don't want you to preach the full truth. But baby, I got to preach the full truth because the Bible says they shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Ain't no watered down message, Pastor Paul, going to set nobody free. Ain't no gummy bear soft message going to set nobody free. I got to continue to preach the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what sets the captives free. That's what sets the captives free. It says, now, Stephen, full of grace, divine blessing, favor, and power. I just, I just want to camp there real quick. Can I camp there, Sammy, with all your camping stuff? Stephen, full of grace, divine blessing, favor, and power. Do you know what your word says about you? You're, you're full of grace. You're full of the blessing of God. You're full of divine favor. You're full of the power of the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power to go and set the drug addict free. To proclaim sight to the blind. Come on, somebody. Is there anybody in this place that says, man, I got an urgency. See, there's an urgency in the Spirit. We, we, we say that sometimes, but there's really an urgency in the spirit because people are going to hell. And you and I, we have the answer. We have the answer. We're the ones that could say, you don't have to live that way, brother. You don't have to live empty, sister. There is a fullness in Christ that you can attain. If, if you ever talk to anybody, it doesn't have to be just a drug addict. If you talk to somebody that was just living a normal life, void of Christ, they were empty. Uh, we, we had a, a young lady come to our church recently, and she just gave her testimony, and it was a Thanksgiving service, and I was crying because, you know, in ministry, especially leaders, if you're a leader in ministry, raise your hand. We're all leaders in ministry. If you serve in the Lord, you're leading at your job. Come on, somebody. Leading at your school. And this young lady, she went up there, and she refreshed my spirit. She started to say, I, I came to this church, and God has saved me. She was so lost 
that recently she took all these pills in a hotel room so she could die. She didn't want to live no more. And you know what she kept saying in her testimony? I was empty. I was empty. I, I couldn't find fulfillment. I was empty. She got so high that they found her. Her family found her at the mall wandering around, not knowing where she was at and who they were. Couple days go by, she ends up at the church somehow. How many know God's got a Holy Ghost appointment? That's why I love the local church because there is a Jesus junction here every Sunday morning. You don't understand how important it is for this church to be a lighthouse to this city. There are drug addicts that are saying, maybe next week I will show up to Cornerstone and give my life to the Lord. And she, she said, and I gave my life to God. And I can't count how many times she kept saying this, Pastor. I'm full. She just kept saying, I'm so full now. My family is so full now. My house is so full now. My heart is so full now. See, when God steps in, he begins to take up the parameter. Come on, somebody. I, I serve a God that fills space. Come on, somebody. I serve a God that mends the brokenhearted. He fills us up. Old song used to say, when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. Come on, sing it. When I think about, this is my favorite part, how he picked me up. And turn me around how he, see, it might be simple, but there is such power in just saying I've been picked up and turned around. I'm not who I was before. Come on, somebody. When did the gospel not be enough for our church pulpits? Here we go. Tell the person next to you, here we go. Stephen was doing great wonders and signs, attesting miracles among the people. But wait, he's supposed to be just serving tables, Sam. He's supposed to be just serving tables, but he's doing wonders, signs, and miracles among the people. That's because when you take your responsibility serious in the kingdom, God will put his super on your natural. Oh, somebody needs to say this tonight. God, I want you to put your super on my natural so I can live a supernatural life. See, it's not insignificant when you're scrubbing the toilets. Come on, somebody. You, you, could, you could just pray, God, when the person sits on this toilet, they get blessed. Come on, somebody. Huh. Huh. Come on, somebody. There they are, just laid out in the spirit right there. Right? God puts his super on your natural, and he can write history with your life. Says this, however, some men... From what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, but they weren't free. Come on, somebody. Rose up and questioned and argued with Stephen. But they were not able to successfully withstand the wisdom and the intelligence of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that when the devil cannot destroy your ministry, it has everything to do with the Holy Spirit? It's not, it's not because of us. We are, we are cooperating with the Holy Spirit. But I love right here that it says they couldn't withstand, they couldn't cope with the wisdom of the Spirit of God upon his life. What am I trying to say tonight is we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This cannot be a house. If we want to do what God's called us to do, and I've heard the vision because I tune in and I love Pastor Paul's preachings. I love Pastor Erica's preachings. We're going to get mental up here soon too. Come on, somebody. You can't hide forever. Come on, mental. Right? God's got a calling. He's going to be one of those that when he starts to proclaim it, it's just going to, everybody's just, it's just going to be so powerful. And if we want to reach the people we're called to reach and do what we're called to do, we, we can't be a people that are reliant on gifting. Because gifting doesn't set the captive free. Talent, even though it sounds good, it doesn't deliver people. It's by the power of the Holy Ghost that we will see this city transformed. So what am I trying to say to you tonight is we need to be reliant. Tell the person next to you, reliant. We, we need to rely. We, we need to rely on God. I, I, I try, every time I minister, I try to lean on God and what he's telling me to do. They weren't able to withstand the spirit that was on him. 
They presented false witnesses who said, this man never stops speaking against this holy place and the law of Moses. They dragged him before the court. For we have heard him say that this Jesus the Nazarene will tear this place down and will change the traditions and customs which Moses handed down to us. Then all those who were sitting in the council stared intently at him and they saw Stephen, Stephen's face was the face of like an angel. I, I wrote down right here, can you shine in your hour of darkness? Are we a church? Come on. Is RFN, is Cornerstone here tonight? Are you a people that in the hour of dark, this is the darkest hour of Stephen's life. He's being dragged before a court. We're going to see what happens in a few more moments. It doesn't get pretty. And in the hour of darkness, he's shining like an angel. I want to know what's going to happen when they come to get us. Read Matthew chapter 24 when Jesus is talking about. Let me tell you, my friends, if you are not ready for persecution, people say, well, it's not going to happen in my, my lifetime. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but let me tell you this. I want to be ready. If it happens, it happens, and I will go out praising my King Jesus. It says that in this hour of darkness that he was shining like an angel. Will we be singing praises when they turn us into prison? Will we be singing praises with a gun to our head? Come on, somebody. Will we be having a praise in our spirit somehow, some way? It's only by the power of the Holy Ghost. It says that he was shining and his face was like the face of an angel. And he replied, he replies a lot, but I, I shorten it down to this towards the end. You stiff-necked and stubborn people uncircumcised in hearts and ears. Huh. You, you, you have the tradition right, but something in your heart hasn't been severed. You are always actively resisting the Holy Spirit and doing just as your fathers did. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were, see this is what happens when you are convicted. This is what happens when the Holy Spirit is upon you. This is what happens when you speak what God tells you to speak without fear of what man is saying. Come on, somebody. This is what happens when your pastor walks into a meeting. Come on, somebody. And says, if we can't agree on life, then I don't know where we're going to agree. Hello, somebody. That's one of my favorite stories right there. Unafraid of the consequences, all of a sudden people get cut to the heart. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit and led by him, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Stephen, in the face of persecution, he looks up and he sees Jesus not sitting on the throne. He sees Jesus standing up. I don't know about you, but I want a commitment to the Lord that makes Jesus get up out of his seat. Come on, somebody. Jesus was standing up. Stephen looks up and he says that he sees the glory. of. Do you, let me ask you something. Do you think Stephen cares about what people say to him at that point? When you look up and you see the man with fire in his eyes standing and looking at you, pleased with you, ready to welcome you, and you see Jesus, the man filled with fire in his eyes that you're madly in love with, and you, you're looking at him, do you think you're going to care what people say about you? Some of us, we care too much of what people say about us because our eyes aren't on Christ. Everything in that moment was still. And he says, look, I see the heavens opened in welcome and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they shouted with loud voices and covered their ears and together rushed at him. Think about this, you guys. Go there in your minds. Go there in your hearts. They covered their ears. This generation don't want truth anymore. want to, want to cut, cover their ears. That's why they're trying to silence the church right now. Because the truth that is coming out, especially from those that have been assigned right now and that are, that are being obedient, they're trying to shut us down. But you can't kill what won't die. 
They tried to kill Jesus. Come on, somebody. You can't kill what won't die. If God called us for such a time as this, nobody can uncall us. Come on, somebody. If we've been chosen for such a time as this, nobody can unchoose us. Come on, somebody. It says they covered their ears and together they rushed at him. Then they drove him out. And let me, let me remind you, this started from distributing food to widows. And we find ourselves here. He's running the distribution of the food. Another version of the Bible says he's serving tables. And he's about to become the first martyr of Christianity. You want to talk about a testimony about how well your ministry is going? Don't tell me how many followers you got and how many people like you. Tell me how many people hate you. You want to talk about what a real ministry is? Come on, somebody. It's pleasing God to the point where the Pharisees are so mad at you that they're trying to push you off a cliff. We, we should start this, Pastor Erica. We should start this movement in the church where we, we stop talking about the shallow things in ministry and, and, and the social media. And you say, man, how many people got really mad at you this week, brother? How many devils did you upset this week, brother? I want to I wanna know about your suffering. Come on, how many know there's fellowship with God in suffering? The Apostle Paul says, I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection, the blessing of ministry, but also in the fellowship of of his suffering. See, there's a fellowship with God that you only get when you're suffering in Christ. There's a fellowship you get with God when you're not on the mountaintop, but you're in the valley. And all of a sudden, he pulls you close, and, and you don't have nowhere else to run to because it's just you and him. Ask David. The warrior wasn't developed when he fought Goliath. The warrior was developed in the dark. The warrior was developed when nobody was looking and he was still obedient. The warrior was developed when he was serving crackers and cheese to his brother. There's a certain fellowship in suffering. That's why in these last days, can I just prophesy, you, you can't be afraid of suffering in these last days. You, you, can't, it's, you can't be afraid because his word says in the last days, yes, it, it shares about the darkness. Yes, it shares about the dark times. But let me remind you about the other portion of it. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Come on, somebody. Is there anybody in this place that knows that even in the last days, God's going to do something powerful? They drove him out of the city and began stoning him. My brother Drew, you can come up and just follow behind me for a minute. Me and Drew, we, we do ministry a lot together, so we, we flow together. How many love brother Drew tonight? They drove him out of the city and began stoning him. My God, I pray for courage like this, God. I pray for boldness like this, Lord. I pray, God. I pray, Lord, for boldness and courage like this, Lord. We, we don't even understand the power of this. I'll, I'll just read it. It says, they began stoning him, and the witnesses placed their outer robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Who we know later to be the Apostle Paul. And just two chapters over in, in chapter 9. God begins to get a hold of the Apostle Paul's life. And you can't tell me when you see something like this in front of you, when you see somebody so committed. See, the Apostle Paul was persecuting Christians. And he looks and he sees a man so committed, so filled with the Holy Spirit that he's shining like an angel, so devoted to Christ that he's looking up and he's saying, I see the glory of the Lord. Thank you. You can't tell me that didn't shake the Apostle Paul. You can't tell me that he didn't leave that place in saying there was something real about what he stood for. You can't tell me that that didn't stick with him as he continued to persecute Christians. He was, he was probably thinking, man, there was, no, there's something real about what they stand for. See, at the end of this story, Stephen gets, he dies, and I was just thinking and I was imagining what that moment in heaven was like. 
The last time Stephen saw the apostle Paul was when they threw their coats at his feet and he was approving of his killing. And I can imagine when the apostle Paul gets to heaven and they meet. Can you imagine the apostle Paul saying that? That God that you stood for, I found him, he found me, and something changed in me, and I found what you found, and I'm here with you. You were right, you were right. Can you imagine, maybe, maybe he tells them, thank you. Thank you for the testimony you were to me. God got a hold of my life shortly after. See, we don't understand the power of us just standing for God right here in this moment, right now in this moment. You see my video, my, my daughter, that was the best part. My daughter leaving that place and she said, I, how come you didn't call me up to preach with you? We're raising up a generation that will stand in the face of adversity, that will stand in the face of persecution and they'll be unashamed of the gospel. Stand to your feet with me. I'm looking for some people that are committed, man. I'm looking for some people that are committed, man. Some people that aren't halfway in and halfway out. The hour for that was yesterday. There was grace for a season, but I, I feel like in this season, God has shaken up the church. And everything that could be shaken off has fallen off. And the remnant has remained. And God is still calling the remnant. Tonight, I just want to share with you that God loves you. Tonight, I just want to share with you that the same God that Stephen died for is here in this room, and he's calling you by name. And God is calling you to give your life to him. I don't care if you've been backslidden. I don't care if you haven't been serving God these last few years. Maybe you are serving God right now, and you need a fresh, fresh fire. You say, man, I've been feeling, I, I feel like this is prophetic right now. I've been filling my life with idols and God hasn't been on the throne of my mind, on my eyes. And I need him to be the center. I need him to be the center of my life. God wants to do that right now in you. Raise your hand if that's you. You say, I want a fresh fire. I want a fresh fire. A fresh commitment. A fresh surrender. A fresh conviction. Where we live with conviction. And we walk according to the spirit of truth. If that's you tonight, just come up here to the front. Come up here to the front. Full surrender. Hallelujah. 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 Fresh commitment right now, God. A fresh surrender in Jesus' mighty name. You could sing that song, Brother Drew. I've never known a love like this. Jesus, what a Savior.